Good afternoon, everybody. I would say let's get started. Fasten your seat belts for this uh, session on the circle economy, frontier of knowledge. My name is uh, Bas de Leeuw. I am actually wearing three hats. My first hat is uh, former secretary of uh, UNEP's International Resource Panel. I'm very happy that I have a, a current member of the IIP uh, with us today. My second head is uh, Managing Director of the World Resources Forum, based in, uh, in Switzerland, with a conference coming up in, uh, in Antwerp next year, in February, also on the circular economy, working together with, uh, with CITRA. And my third head is that I'm a member of the Club of Rome. We had last week in Rome, we celebrated our 50th anniversary and uh, we even got uh, a complete new movement in the club. We have now the white old male club has now been transformed to a much more modern uh, club of advisors. And we even have two, uh, two female presidents, one of them uh, coming from, uh, from Africa. Why am I saying this? All those three heads I had to do with science, not as a scientist myself, but uh, working in the area of sustainable uh, policy, sustainable developments, knowing that there is a lot of things that everybody can already do for the circular economy, but you also need inventions, new technologies, new materials, new business models, and for that you need science. And now it's a matter of, and that is the thing that we are going to discuss in this, uh, in this session, are we all, all the stakeholders, going to sit and wait until the scientists will solve it, will, until they do the circular economy for us? Or are we actively going out and looking for the science, the inventions, the new technologies and models that are already there, perhaps, but we did not yet discover them, or we did not know about them, or maybe they are too, too expensive, or we, we just don't feel like using those new technologies because of uncertainty? That is the question uh, for this session uh, today that we are trying to answer from various perspectives. You see already the first three speakers uh, uh, lined up here on the, uh, on the podium. It's uh, Mr. Takashi Shimazu from Toyota Central Lab. You can give a hand. It's Helen Metz from DSM. Please, a big hand for Helen. And Nabi Nasser from the International Resource Panel. So now I have the honor to give the floor to Mr. Sivazu. Thank you for kind introduction. My name is Takashi Shimazu. I will talk about this title, the Technical Challenge for the Carbon Dioxide Recycling Aiming the Circular Economy. This is today's content. Firstly, I will introduce the background of this presentation. The second is I will talk about main topics, artificial photosynthesis. After then, I will talk about briefly the current and the future research, the final read, the summary. Introduction. The first, let me introduce our company, Toyota Central Research and Development Laboratories. Our company was jointly established by Toyota Group in 1960 as an advanced research lab to create new business and industry then to contribute to human prosperity. We are researching the wide fields, not only the automobile, but also industry, the human science, and the environment, and so on. At WCEF 2017 last year, as you can see, these nine key messages were shown. As a company rule, these red four messages we must promote protection of natural resources and the circular economy to realize sustainable development goals. And as a research institute role, 
these brutal messages, we must create new technology that reduce pollution, recycle waste, and contribute to decarbonize the society. In the field of the automobiles, material and fuel were both rooted in linear economy so far. However, from now on, we must promote, reuse, and recycle of the automobile parts aiming for the circular material flow. In the same way, the fuels must replace from fossil fuel to renewable fuel like hydrogen, biofuel, and artificial photosynthesis fuel that we introduced today. At 2015, Toyota Motor Corporation declared the sixth challenge as Toyota Environmental Challenge 2050 including carbon dioxide reduction against climate change, circulation of water, and materials, in order to realize a sustainable development together with society. The way would contribute to realize a circular economy, coexisted with environment and employed through these six challenges. We are studying artificial photosynthesis as a core technology for the circular economy. This synthesis is production technology from sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide to organic matter, like chemical materials and fuel. Carbon dioxide emission is recycled and used as next feedstocks. That we introduced previous research on artificial photosynthesis and our future challenges. Here, I will talk about technical approaches for artificial photosynthesis in my laboratory. Photosynthesis is an energy conversion from solar energy to chemical energy. Artificial photosynthesis process is similar to the combination of solar panels and water electrolyzer. The difference is that carbon dioxide gas is reduced to organic matters instead of the proton reduction of the hydrogen. Organic matters are utilized as chemical product and fuels. Then generated carbon dioxide is recycled. This image shows the reaction of photosynthesis in nature. This reaction consists of light absorber and oxidation reaction and reduction reaction. And this image shows the schematic reaction mechanism of artific artificial photosynthesis. Semiconductors materials are used as light absorber and connected with water oxidation catalysis and carbon dioxide reduction catalysis. Several candidate materials for water oxidation have been reported. However, it was difficult to reduce carbon dioxide with high reaction selectivity instead of the hydrogen generation. We developed the carbon dioxide reduction photoelectrode composed of the semiconductor material and metal complex catalysis. Some metal complex catalysis are capable of the carbon dioxide reduction catalysis. This figure shows our first device and the schematic illustration. Titanium dioxide photoelectrode was selected and combined with carbon dioxide reduction photoelectrode. This consists of lutetium complex catalysis and indium phosphide semiconductors. It can generate it for mate with over 80% of the reaction selectivity. Two compartments were immersed in the aqueous solution, saturated with carbon dioxide, and separated with membrane to prevent the undesired back reaction. The fan this two compartment device was irradiated with simulated solar light. Formate was successfully generated with 0.04% of solar to chemical energy conversion efficiency. This is the first robot 
of artificial photosynthesis using only carbon dioxide and water as raw materials. As a next challenge, we try to simplify the two compartment device to a monolithic device. We found that a regime catalysis is capable of selective water oxidation in the presence of the formate. We also facilitate carbon dioxide reduction by using carbon substrate for ruthenium complex polymer. In addition, commercially available triple junction amorphous silicon cell was used as the right absorber to facilitate the electron transfer. Here I show the video of carbon dioxide photo reduction by monolithic device. When the device was irradiated, a lot of bubbles were generated from the front side of the device. Those the bubbles were of oxygen, which is generated from the oxidation of water. Carbon dioxide was also converted into formate in the backside. The energy conversion efficiency was improved to 4.6%. Since we achieved 0.04% utilizing two compartment devices in 2011, the efficiency was progressively improved we realized a simple monolithic device with 4.6% in 2015. The efficiency is comparable with that of the natural plants. However, the utility value of the formate is low compared with the sugar synthesized by natural plants. We are considering that one of the applications is the formate fuel cell system. Here, I will talk about the current and the future research. There are two challenges aiming for the societal implementation. One is the cost reduction of catalysis for large-scale application. And the other is the diversification of the carbon dioxide products for usability. I showed a table of the approximately estimated material cost, which utilized in a monolithic device. The cost of ruthenium complex catalysis and iridium oxide catalysis account for the 20% respectively. Now we are trying to replace the element of the catalysis from novel metals to as abundant metals for cost reduction. We replaced carbon dioxide reduction catalysis from ruthenium to manganese and water oxidation catalysis from iridium to iron. The manganese complex catalysis can generate carbon monoxide and hydrogen in a neutral condition. Those are usable component as singers. The nickel modified iron hydroxide shows higher activity for water oxidation reaction compared with other iron-related materials. And its activity in the alkaline condition exceeds that of the iridium oxide. The, com the combination of this catalysis for new artificial photosynthesis device is under investigation because of the difference of the suitable reaction condition. Next, this figure shows the application of the, our artificial photosynthesis technologies to recycle carbon dioxide. Toyota Group is challenging to get carbon dioxide emission to zero at industry. And we hope our technology can contribute this challenge. As an approach for the diversification of the carbon dioxide product, we also focus on syngas generation. 
from carbon dioxide and water. The other process is multi electron reduction of formate and syn gas to produce arc four and alkene. Those can be utilized in an existing summer process to produce various chemical products. Syn gas is generated from the reforming of natural gas. Various raw organic chemicals can be synthesized from syn gas, then converted to fuels, medicine, and chemical products. Fuels and chemical products are combi combusted to carbon dioxide after using. In our company, we are starting the research for the direct synthesis of syn gas from exhausted carbon dioxide and water as carbon dioxide recycling process. Our target for MOE project is 10% of the efficiency. Let me summarize this talk. We encourage researchers aiming for the circular economy. We are researching the artificial photosynthesis reaction to realize a carbon neutral society. We are seeking a suitable road to the associated implementation of the artificial photosynthesis. Thank you for kind attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for your uh, most important talk. Um, when we have questions, we can try to remember them because we have a panel presentation after the first uh, three speakers. Now I give the, the floor to uh, Helen Metz. She is from uh, DSM, working from Amsterdam. And she will also talk about uh, science and uh, scientific advancements in materials enabling circular economy. Helen. Thank you, Bas, and can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And I actually work for a company called DSM. Now, does anybody heard of DSM? A few hands. We're probably one of those big companies that not a lot of people have heard about, but all of you use our products. So we are a nutrition and material science company. So you will have our ingredients in your food. You will have enzymes in your products. You'll use our hair care products, our creams, our sunscreens. In your telephones, there will be plastics from DSM. On your floors, there will be coatings. On your walls, there will be paints. So the list goes on and on. And I've been asked to talk about, do I believe that science and material capabilities can drive a circular economy. Now, I think you know my answer because I wouldn't be standing here if I wasn't gonna say yes. But before I actually share some of the things that we're doing as DSM, I wanna take you all back and I wanna tell a story. I'm gonna take you back to the very beginning. Before light and darkness had been divided, before the moon and the stars had been created, and before the land and the seas had been formed. A single lonely atom of carbon lies very still just beneath the surface. For millions of years, it lies a very quiet life just beneath the surface, subject only to small fluctuations in temperature, in pressure, as the universe evolved and transformed around it. Then one summer day, and let's call it 120 years ago, because that's actually when DSM was formed, and DSM actually stands for Dutch State Mines. So over 120 years, we've gone through our own transformation, two big transformations. But just imagine the rock where the atom lies is dug up, and life suddenly becomes much more exciting. It's separated from other atoms in the rock, and as it's burnt, 
it gets two very close friends and it's flung up into the air. For several decades, the atom travels the world on a true organic adventure. It's consumed, it's digested, it's expelled by falcons, by lizards, by humans. It is dissolved in a polar ice caps, torrents, seas, rivers, and it becomes part of trees and flowers and grass in a seemingly never-ending circular cycle that goes on and on and on. And for me personally, this carbon atom represents the full scope of nature's circular cycle. A system where materials flow, where one species waste is another species food, and where things live in balance by recycling and by, re by reusing the same common building blocks. A system where energy is provided by the sun, where things grow, where they die, and where nutrients return to the soil safely. This is a system that has worked flawlessly for millions and millions of years, that has allowed our planet to flourish, that has enabled the careful harmony of Mother Nature's ecosystem. But it is a system that during the past century, which the past century, it's just a nanosecond in the planet's history, human activity has decided to reject it and replace it with what we've been talking about a lot over the last 24 hours, the linear cycle. The cycle where we talk about take, make, and dispose. This linear economic cycle has for too long relied on resources and accessible fossil fuel energy. It's been driven, in my opinion, by short-sighted consumption, and it's created a world where, as consumers, we find it easier to dispose of things than to repair. When we want a new phone, we throw the old one away. If our coffee machine breaks, it's cheaper to buy a new one than to repair the old one. When we're thirsty, we get a plastic water bottle. We throw it away. When the thirst returns, we get another plastic water bottle. We throw it away. By following this linear model, we all know, everybody in this room, what is happening. We are eating into the finite supply of capital, and we're adding to the growing mountains of waste. It's a system that simply cannot and must not continue. And as a mother and a grandmother, this is not the system that I want to leave to my children and my grandchildren. And as a leader, it is not a system that is OK to continue in business. So what if all companies and countries actually reaccepted the living world's secular model as the blueprint of how we operate. Can we use it to change our way of thinking, to innovate, and in particular, does science and material technology help enable circular? Well, those are the questions that at DSM we're asking ourselves every day. And it is possible. For many years now, DSM has been looking at the following. What are our core capabilities as a material and science company? And how can we use these core capabilities to address the big issues in the world, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? And we've chosen three domains, nutrition and health, climate and energy, and resource scarcity, designing for circularity. So what have we come up with? Well, there's a number of things. We all know that the population is growing. The consumption of fish is growing two times the population growth. We know that salmon is a form of omega that people actually want more and more of. For salmon to actually be grown, 
they eat over their lifetime 60 times more small fish than the salmon. So in these salmon farms, we're feeding salmon fish after fish after fish. We've developed algae that actually replaces these fish in a very natural way, so allows us to continue to, fish the o to, to, to clean the oceans or let the ocean survive. We know that methane, one of the issues with methane is cows. We've developed what I call a vitamin C tablet, which actually allows the cow to digest and reduce the methane by 50%. We're also doing tests over the last three years to make sure the cows are happy. But these are examples in our vitamin business, in our nutrition business, of how we're using science to address the issues. In our materials business, we're using plant-based resins for paint. We're also developing products like this. Because by putting the bright minds together, this is a philosophy. A philosophy called Niaga. Niaga is again backwards, again and again and again. And we basically call ourselves designers who are redesigning stuff to take out toxic and non-sustainable materials. And the first product that we've designed is this first 100% recyclable carpet. It's a polyester with a polyester with a polyester. So these are the, the grains, they go back into the carpet, the carpet comes full cycle. Now just imagine what that means. It means that you can buy this product, we'll bring it back. Because we can take it back to carpet. Today in the US, there is 1.8 billion kilotons alone of carpet waste every year. There's five, mil, five billion US dollars of carpet waste every year impacting climate change. We have a solution. Now you can just imagine where this goes because you can order this carpet online. It's very easy to install, it's one layer. You don't need all of those people installing carpet. If you don't like your carpet, you can return your carpet. But in addition, what we've been able to do through innovation is in the carpet, if it is not a mono, there is an adhesive. This adhesive can be clicked and unclicked. So basically, you can separate the materials. So imagine this is just the first product, a carpet. But we're actually working with a couple of different partners. We're working with mattress companies to actually design recyclable mattresses, another huge waste issue. We're working with a company called Eco, who are just outside here on different applications for building and construction for furniture, where you can separate materials back to their full circular cycle. And can you imagine, just think about sustainable rooms. Because this carpet here, not only is it sustainable, but it's also zero VOC. So in terms of health, which is one of our domains, it's the healthiest carpet on the world, in the world. For those who attended Google, we heard that Google are looking at how they build their maps. They're putting sensors so that you can see actually the clean air of countries, of streets. Can you imagine that we build that technology with Google to have clean air with rooms? And we add an app together with Sarah at Apple, and we create sustainable living spaces with clean air where you just rent and reuse your products. This is imagining circular. Now, is it easy? No. And again, for one of repeating the messages, we can only do it together as companies, as NGOs, as governments to actually make it happen. But it is possible. And I want to come back to my story being circular to actually wrap it up. Because you'll be pleased to know That carbon atom that I started with, 
that traveled the seven continents, continents and the five oceans, the one that spent millions of years lying under the surface, only to be dug up and fed back into the organic life cycle. It's got a legacy. In 2017, our atom's little sister found her way into the soil of a Dutch town called Zwolle. It was dug up with other raw materials and then processed by one of DSM's suppliers. And now, well, now that little sister is part of a Niagara adhesive resin. And as part of that closed loop system, that atom's final destiny will help create brighter lives for all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Helen, for this wonderful presentation. I mean, science can also sound like poetry, no? It's beautiful, beautiful. Um, Nabil uh, Nazar, uh, I already uh, introduced him as a member of the International Resource Panel. Uh, you see on the screen uh, that he has also uh, some other business, uh, director of the Institute for Sustainability of the uh, Rochester Institute. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I have the, uh, the difficult task in, uh, in actually presenting to you a report that has taken uh, three years to reach this point. So this is actually the official first time actually uh, we're launching this report here in front of you here today. So, you know, again, the, the resource, uh, the International Resource Panel uh, has engaged in uh, in the circular economy discussion, and, and, and this is one of our projects in this area, and that's what I'm going to be presenting here uh, to you. So, uh, as we all know, circular economy stands for two major factors, two major goals that we have in the circular economy. Is, is the, the first one is to maximize the efficiency through uh, both resource utilization and value retention. So you will hear a lot more here in the study about value retention and what, how we can achieve that. One of the things that we do in the circular economy discussion, we always talk about top-down analysis and approaches. And what you're going to see here in the study that is different, that we're really doing top-down, bottom-up analysis. And it was not very easy to do that uh, due to the lack of information uh, and data in this area. The value retention processes, as we're defining in this report, are processes that retain value within the system through direct reuse, repair, refurbishment, and remanufacturing. So we all understand recycling. We understand the value of recycling. The processes that are less known and less studied are these processes. We call those value retention processes, distinguishing them from recycling, as these processes actually tend to retain the value that we embedded in this, process, in this product, in this component, and, and that's what we're trying to study and trying to assess in this, in this report. Obviously, there's potential benefits uh, in, in, uh, in better having, in, in better understanding the value of these processes uh, as they can contribute to reducing environmental uh, impacts as well as economic, uh, economic prosperity for uh, countries that actually engage in doing this work as well as, as, as businesses. The impact of this report is, the goal for our report is, is primarily in to inform policy, but in the meantime also we're looking at other stakeholders and making sure that the report provide value to the other stakeholders. So this, is, this might look like a complicated chart here for you, but it is critical uh, chart here related to the processes that exist in businesses and, uh, uh, and it really hi highlights many of the challenges that we have in really understanding the circular economy processes. If you take a look at the top half, we're talking about processes that are factory-based. And at the bottom half, those are processes that are used in repair facility or intermediate uh, maintenance uh, facility. And what we're trying to define here that really uh, mimic what you see in, in actually in real life and in, in actually in, in the environment where a lot of these processes take place. So you would see at the first, uh, at the first one, you would see that we call it the new build or the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. So the product is designed to last for a certain life cycle. If this product comes back 
at that end of use, we call end of use versus end of life, um, you know, we end up taking that product and disassembling it to the component level and, and basically go through that remanufacturing processes that bring the product back to like new condition. So here we can go multiple life cycles and obviously that has significant impact on reducing material consumption, reducing environmental impact, and, and all the energy also consumed in making this product. If you take a look at many of the products that we have today, like copiers, for example, you would see that uh, the, 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 the product itself can last 10 years, but the technology make the product obsolete much, much faster than that. So basically, remanufacturing is a way for us to retain the value that we embedded in making this product and bring the product back to the consumer in a like new condition and, and like new of today is new, not when the product was made. And you can see the next level is a comprehensive refurbishment, and that's again factory-based operation where you're not quite um, doing the product or dealing with the product like what you do in remanufacturing, uh, but close to that. And it's another form of extending the life cycle of this product. At the bottom half, basically, we deal with the, the reuse, the repair, and refurbishment, which is uh, done less uh, rigorously as uh, compared to the, the, the factory-based operation with comprehensive refurbishment. These are new classification. These are a uh, result of our study for three years in different countries. And the goal for the report is, is primarily to understand and assess and, and quantify these processes at the process level and, 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 and making sure that we understand the, uh, the contribution of these processes. We also looked at it from a country level, from an economy level, in terms of what's the value of implementing more of these processes on an economy and a country. And, and, and that was uh, studied in four, year, four countries as example, as a sample of, of, uh, of what we, uh, we used. We also looked into the, uh, the impact of regulatory uh, policy and, and many of the factors that impact further implementation of this value retention uh, processes. And the goal, again, was, um, was also to address uh, uh, other stakeholders to make sure that we provide guidance to industry in terms of what it, what it is that can be done at the industry level that can further their implementation in this area. So again, my challenge is to summarize a three-year uh, long report here to you in 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm going to go this, uh, to, to do this uh, very quickly. Uh, but one of the things that we try to do, and the, the report, by the way, as, as we always do with the International Resource Panel uh, reports, they are available free online. And uh, right after this session, which is the official launch of the report, you can actually download the entire report, uh, which you can read it in your, um, in your trip back home. It's only 271 pages. And, uh, <laughs> and it's very entertaining with a lot of data there. So. Uh, what we try to do is actually, for the first time, we're looking into the material flow in production. So for the first time, we're looking into material flow here, taken into account, if you see the bottom here, we're looking into recycled material, we're looking into domestic cores, which is a product that is, we call it the end of use product. The product is no longer in use. That cores, the cores basically represent significant material value to us that we use in production of other products. And then we have imported cores and we have diversion material. And we try to assess the entire system throughout this study. Uh, and we studied that in four countries. So countries actually represent significant manufacturing output globally, uh, uh, US and Germany in the developed world and, and China and Brazil in the developing world. The reason we choose China and Brazil because many of these processes are already taking place there uh, unlike many other developing countries where that was not the case. So again, the bottom-up, top-down approach uh, to ensure that we're looking at the macroeconomics issues and we're looking into the, the impact as we look into different economies, the impact of these processes. So the study actually looked into the material requirements uh, for production. We're looking into the embodied uh, material energy, the embodied material emission. We looked into process energy and emission as well. And we looked into the cost advantage of these processes as well as 
employment because it was very important for policymakers to understand if this process is going to contribute to more employment or less employment. And uh, just a quick sample of results here. Um, we studied many different sectors, and uh, in each sector we have multiple samples, companies that actually collected data from. Uh, the result, again, was bottom-up, significant analysis, looking at the product and the makeup of a product, the components of the product, the, the weight and the material content and the emission, all the factors that I mentioned earlier. So this here is one extreme because of the limited time. I, I can't show you all of them, but if you read the tw 271 pages, you will be able to see more. So you can see here, this is one industry that were actually endorsed the circular economy before actually the circular economy was, was very popular. So this actually, the, the, the large printing equipment, digital equipment, you can see here making new products from an econo economic level constitute over 60%, 66% of the dollars flow in this, in this businesses. The remanufacturing represent 32%. Repair and refurbishment yeah, are very tiny in this area. Taking into account that remanufactured products sell for like half of the cost of new, you would see that this actually does not necessarily map to the number of units produced. So here's a sector that actually is doing aggressively, implementing aggressively this technology. You can see that they have made huge economic, they have huge economic impact when you think of that volume that is remanufactured actually is, is using significantly less resources, and I'll show you that here in a minute. So this here, this, uh, this chart here showing, the first one on the left showing the environmental impact. And what's very important here to see is, is the energy consumption. And you can see when we make one of those machines brand new, you can see that first bar that you see, that very high bar, that's the energy consumption in making that new machine. If we're remanufacturing it or refurbish it, you can see that energy bar is much, much less. And these are real data from actual real case studies. So you can see here that the impact of using this value retention processes from an energy consumption. The other factors are other environmental impact, and you can see that also there is a difference between making the product new and, and re using the value retention processes. The one on the right, you can see that blue bar there, that is the, the material consumption. Uh, version material consumption. So you can see here significant material consumption when you do that versus the second set of, uh, of bars here are for, uh, for remanufacturing and then refurbishment. So clearly there is huge difference between this, uh, between making the product brand new versus using the value retention processes. And uh, my last two slides here talk about the, the, the recommendation, so how do we actually entice businesses to do more and how actually we provide guidance to governments, policymakers, to actually um, to make sure they are uh, guiding implementation of more practices in this area. So just to, uh, to, to do well on, on a couple of those, one of the things that, one of the major barriers that we have in this area is market access. There's significant barrier to actually what we call the end of use product flowing from one country to another, flowing from one state to another, as, as might exist in some countries. So in a way, we're blocking that flow of the raw material that we use in remanufacturing or value retention processes, many times unintentionally. So policy, regulation, market access are a huge issue. Uh, the other issues that we deal with is lack of investment, for example, in encouraging and, and um, getting more uh, investment in, in uh, companies that actually do pro this kind of processes. Uh, the other thing is, is definitions. We continue to talk about the three R's, which are very, very important. There's no doubt. However, they tend to not include many of the factors that, or many of the processes that we use in, under that value retention processes. So very important to actually update our systems, our standards, along with, uh, with, the, uh, with the old uh, processes that, that actually have proven to be very helpful. Now, we also looked into, we have a report also that you can download on that uh, direction also to industry. So uh, adoption of this uh, systems is, is, is kind of uh, very limited. Uh, the, the intensity of value retention processes in many countries that actually have far less barriers, like the US, for example, is extremely low at this point of time. The average is very low. So uh, very important to, uh, 
to actually in, enhance the adoption uh, coordination. Uh, again, that's a system level work that need to happen and industry cannot do it without uh, further collaboration. So uh, the others, I think, from uh, increasing the R&D to ensuring that their infrastructure available, all of that, I think, are part of our recommendation in terms of enhancing the system that allow us to do more in this area. So, uh, so my, time, my time is up, so I, uh, I'm going to stop here, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Nabil. Well, your time is never up, of course. We, we want to, uh, to listen to sharing your wisdom uh, forever. Uh, thank you so much for capturing this, uh, this 276 pages report in, uh, in only a few minutes. I mean, reading it uh, on the way home, um, I will fly 12 hours to Switzerland back. I think I can manage. It might even uh, keep me awake in the plane, I'm not sure. But who lives here in Japan, in Tokyo? Who lives here in Japan, in Tokyo? Your hands, please. So you will have to read 276 pages in half an hour? Do you have a summary on Twitter, perhaps? Maybe that's easier. <laughs> OK, um, now it's question time. We have been listening to uh, three wonderful presentations, all on scientific advancements for the circular economy. Um, the, uh, the presenters are here, so now you have your chance of asking for clarification. Of course, not every slide will have been as clear and comprehensible as you might wish. There are a couple of slides I didn't even understand uh, myself. On the other hand, of course, if I, br if I bring my, my car to the garage and when the technician, when I, when, I takes it, when I take it back and the technician says, starts to explain what he has been doing, the engineer, then I just think like, can I drive away with it? That's okay, right? I don't need to have all the nitty gritty. Um, but you want to know what is it doing, that science, and how does it contribute to, uh, to the circular economy? Who would like to, uh, to ask a question or make a short statement on any of the three presentations? Who can I invite? Sir, are there microphones? Please. Hello, my name is Chris Radway. Hello, my name is Chris Radway from uh, Startup um, Sector Economy Consultancy, Circular Economy Limited. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Shamazu, please, about the um, artificial photosynthesis. Um, you mentioned your target is 10% um, efficiency rate. Um, how far away is that? And um, will that be enough to make it economically viable? And how long before we have um, 100,000 tonne per year plants making fuels and bioplastics. Thank you. It's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> so, for free, for free, is, um, I achieved the 10% efficiency is in the, uh, three or five years. But in the research phase, not in a mass production phase. So, thank you. <laughs> Takashi san, uh, I have the one question to you. Uh, my name is James Chu from Taiwan. Uh, for the Olympic uh, two, 2020 in Japan, right, there, there's a hydrogen fuel uh, policy. Uh, how is the uh, Toyota response to it? I'm sorry, again. <laughs> Please question again. Okay, my question is, uh, that the Olympic were held in uh, uh, Tokyo in the uh, 2020, right? 20, uh, 2020. So hy hydrogen the fuel, uh, this kind of uh, policy, and the Toyota's, uh, what's uh, your, uh, your react to it, or the, your, what's uh, your strategy? Yeah. Toyota Motor Corporation is the main sponsor of the Tokyo Olympic. So the, uh, 
I hear from the Toyota Motor Corporation. My company is different from the Toyota Motor Corporation. So the, I hear Toyota Motor Corporation that Toyota uh, support the fuel cell bus in Tokyo. Thank you. Look at those two speakers. They didn't get any questions so far, you know. Uh, in the back. So, Sand Carrier from the aforementioned eCore Technologies. I am surprised by the amount of people that are so attentively listening to a subject that is quite complicated. And would, when you consider circular and economy might not be the first starting point, would you have any conclusions or thoughts on applied sciences and why this is so popular? Or would it be such a good starting point for a circular economy? Thank you. I start with you. So, so I, if I understand your question correctly, you're, you're asking uh, about the advancement of science and how that can help the circular economy. Did I get that right? Well, well it surprises me to see that it is a, a quite complicated part of circular economy. Right. And there is a lot of attention uh, in the room as well. So I was wondering on your thoughts on why this is, and if we can conclude that science is, and material science is actually a starting uh, point for circular economy. I think it, it's a, this, is a, this is an excellent question. The, the analysis that, that was done in, in the report that I was involved in uh, have shown that there are barriers, many barriers to circular economy in order to make uh, to make a lot of the practices in the circular economy efficient, economical, and adoptable by businesses. And in many cases, the science is really needed to address many of those challenges. In some cases, because we haven't addressed this kind of problems before, and they weren't looked at in the same way that we'd like to look at it from a circular economy perspective, in other cases, because we really needed some innovation and some scientific approaches to allow us to alleviate some of those barriers that allow us to actually do further implementation of the circular economy. So, so definitely there are many challenges. If it was, uh, if it was doable, we probably everybody would be doing it now, but I think there is definitely a lot, a lot of development need to happen in order to make sure that the implementation are guided by, uh, by those challenges. Um, and maybe to add, because I do think it's a really valid question and it is interesting. That, I mean, there's, it's a big conference, so there's a lot of people now very interested in circular. But speaking from a corporation standpoint, where a lot of science actually is, I think one of the challenges has been um, what do you measure companies on? And I know that from a DSM or just a lot of companies' perspectives, Eight years ago, if you'd gone out and said, we are going to really focus our people on planet issues, they would go, hey, that doesn't go. Because actually, planet is more philosophical. We need you guys to make profit. I think today, people have much more acceptance of corporations that what you've got to be working on is also the planet. So there's much more acceptance. And I think in the future, companies have to actually be applying their science. So I think that will also add to the acceleration of thinking about the whole circular economy and using science. Thank you. Mr. Shimazu, what is the main barrier for environmental technologies in circular economy? So I think the barrier is how to balance the economic potential with an environmental improvement. So the many people and environment Environment parameter is very important, but many people say the economy is very important. I need the balance. Thank you. Any more questions over here? Uh, microphone. <laughs> yeah, I'm Li Jia Sen, you from Center for Socioeconomic Development based in Geneva. I have one question for Mr. Nasso and one question for the whole panel. The question to you, sir, is really about what you said about trade barrier, which is making the flow of material impossible. I was just wondering, as one of the, the leading panel on this, what do you have in mind in terms of strategy to change and move the WTO? Because we have seen that, you know, we think the WTO in terms of negotiation on environment, 
uh, environmental goods and services have been stalled for a long time. So this is just one question. And the second question for the whole panel is actually has been bothering me for the last two days because we are talking about circular economy in the context of sustainable development. And we should not forget that is one important element which is about social justice, social inclusion, and social development. So if we do not address this, I don't think we would be able to reach the goal in terms of sustainability. But we have not really talked about this during the, the, the last two days. So what kind of scientific innovation or breakthrough we need to think about in order to bring about institutional innovation and uh, also realignment? So that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. So let's first do uh, the trade question. What does the IAP do to uh, convince the WTU to now finally take the environmental aspect into account? So the, uh, the, the International Resource Panel actually is a, is a very unique um, in, a, in, in a way it's structured. So we have 40 of the top experts in the world who actually address many of the challenges, many of the, the opportunities that exist in a very scientific way. Now, the steering committee consists of policymakers. So we get the mandate from the policymakers to study an area. We do it in a very independent way and, and also in a very scientific fashion. So what was very clear in the analysis is that they're, they're unlike making new product and selling it throughout the world, when you remanufacture products, the, 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 basically the end of use product is our raw material. And when you block the flow of this material, you actually are making significant uh, hindrance to actually circular economy and a lot of the circular implementation. So there are significant barriers in this area that we identified. There is significant burden on companies actually to do this work because of these barriers. And there are many countries today that would not let this material flow go to, uh, to facilities where the product can be done. How to deal with it is, is really is, is in the hands of the policymaker to discuss and figure out what policy action they can take because many of those are, are national policies and many of those, there are a variety of policy challenges uh, that, that deal with this issue. We identify the challenge, we identify the barrier, we uh, clearly identify the impact of removing this barrier on that economy and the environmental impact as well. And then it's up to policymakers to actually find out the best way to address it. Thank you. Would you also like to uh, give answer to the second? I think the, the, your second question, I think, is, is also a wonderful question. This is actually my panel, which I just left a few minutes ago uh, to come to the session, is talking about exactly the same area, the same issues, and ensuring that that's considered a lot of the socioeconomic impacts as well as, uh, as, as a technological impact on market impacts as well. So definitely the reports that we're involved in at the IRP taking that seriously, and it's, it's part of our uh, report related to resource governance and related to circular economy uh, innovation. So uh, you will see a lot more in our panel addressing this issue. So it is not uh, neglected at all in, in our discussion. I, I, I feel exactly the same, that it, it's just, it was not the subject of the discussion, but I think it's a very, very valid observation that it's not talked about enough uh, throughout the last 24 hours. But I think as you're looking at the whole circular economy, you can't forget it because actually it's not, it doesn't work without that important element of it. So I think also a lot of companies are taking that viewpoint as well. Thank you. Any more questions? That side of the room has been very silent over there. The microphone. Can you raise your hand again? Well, then let's compensate for this side of the, of the room. Uh, my name is Bart Mosmoller. I work also for DSM, as Helen does. And my, I was struck by Ms. Anazia's concept of value retention. We look a lot at life cycle assessments, but we do not look at the value retention of materials as well. So I would like to have the comments of the panelists on, uh, let's say, beyond the LCA concept, on the value retention concept, because even, for instance, if the carpet would be burned, the, the, the value would even be negative, right? So do we enough factor this in, or should we even more uh, take care of, of value retention in circular design?
Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, I mean, uh, again, we, we looked into all the, the circular processes from recycling to refurbishment to remanufacturing and so on. And obviously, the value retention gives you the highest value, the, 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 the lowest impact, the environmental impact, and, and the better economics. And I think it's very important in, in, in design that we actually take that into account and ensuring that we're facilitating that by design. And there, you know, as I said, the report has guidance to industry, guidance to uh, policymakers, and I think the uh, putting more emphasis on where the value is and ensuring that we are addressing that is going to really be very helpful in making sure that the economics of application of circle models uh, can work. Thank you. We have time left for only one. Who really has this burning question without answer? You cannot leave the room. There. It has to be a good one now. Eh? The expectations are Thank high. you. I hope it's a good one. Um, good afternoon. Christian Tock from the Ministry of the Economy of Luxembourg. Um, I have a question on the polyester carpet because I think it's a wonderful example of, of how you can use material science and design to produce that. But it's only circular ready as such because if it doesn't travel in the right value chains, it's still not circular in the end. So my question is because you, you touched upon it very briefly, you say we take the carpet back. So are you taking it back today? How, how did you manage that? Is there take-back systems? Do you sell it as a service? Are you doing that yourself? Do you work with, with uh, the, the next uh, element in the value chain? These kind of, of, of questions. And then is it realistic to think that in a not too distant future, uh, we won't sell carpets anymore, but they will completely be under this, this uh, as a service or performance economy scheme? Thank you. So, thank you. Short answer. A short answer. Um, yes, I think it's in in the not too di distant future. That end result is you don't care if you own the carpet or not. And your second question about are we recycling? We have experiments on the whole circular because that is the story. We have two machines out, so this is a let's say a viable experiment right now. But we're not going to do it ourselves. Because actually, there's a lot of people know better and are already doing much more themselves already on how to return those systems. So I think for me, the one thing that we don't have is speed in a lot of these actual issues that we've got. So that is why I think we've got to be very clear on what are the problems that we are trying to solve and who else has already solved that problem. So we're very externally orientated now about what we're doing and how we're doing it and bringing in a lot of different partners. And it's amazing when you go out and start talking about a concept like Niaga of, of redesigning stuff in a circular way, how many people already are doing work that you can benefit from. So I think it changes, and carpet's the first product. I think it changes the entire way that we look at businesses. Thank you. Well, this has to be the end of the panel discussion. Please give them a, a big hand. You may leave the stage. So normally we would now go out and have a coffee and be glad the session is over, but we have two more speakers. We have a bonus, because we talked about uh, scientific advancements on energy and materials and models. We didn't really address the ICT sector. And if there is one sector that has potential uh, in terms of, si of advancements for the circular economy, it's of course the ICT. So I would like to... Uh, uh, call to the stage uh, both gentlemen who will enlighten us about uh, ICT. It's uh, Georgos uh, Demetrio, he's a professor in, uh, in France, right, in Paris, and uh, Carl Franken of Vito, Belgium, one of our partners. Uh, who is starting? <laughs> Did you already fight who will start? The floor is yours. With, with your permission, I will just go outside to the podium. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just to know for what you're expecting here is like 17 slides and a slight short animation so that you don't get bored with me. Um, our presentation is mainly linked to the technological aspects, and this is very important for us. However, although focusing on the technology aspects, we, we, we came up with other conclusions as well that uh, actually became the motto of the research. Um, 
So we were talking about technology and circular economy, so then we have to talk about these technologies. Which technologies do we see that we have a relation and will impact the circular economy? In this context, what we see is that big data, Internet of Things, blockchain, artificial intelligence, cloud, 3D printing, robotics, virtual reality, and autonomous vehicles are part of those technologies that will uh, you be used as a vehicle to advance circular economy in isolation or in combination. We'll see some examples uh, in a while. But some facts and figures that we need to have in, into account. 87% of the consumers never heard the term of Internet of Things. Now, would you think about why is this is important? This is important because if you're using actually something that could create the business model and you don't even know about it, how are we talking about consumer awareness, how we're talking about being able to plan and develop models that would help us expedite the circular economy. Then we're talking that by 2020, we have 25 billion connected things that will be in use and their disruptive impact will fall across the industries. That is so true, and this is we're seeing it every single day. We'll show an example of that as well. So the Internet of Things and actually these connected devices, that, that will be revol a revolution in the system to come, the system of the circular economy. Because, I mean, we all know that a good decision relies on a good set of information. So if we want to take a very good decision, we need to have the quality and the accuracy of the information in order to do so. IoT, in a way, and I will show you in a while, it's providing for that. And also the economy that is going to be enabled through the new, new disruptive industry. So some very quick applications, because I go, before I go to other examples, is, is Rubicon, which is a cloud big data platform which connects waste producers, and that optimizes the cycle of the collection and the processing uh, as well. Uh, the famous robot of Apple in, this, in the field of the robotics, Liam, which can dismantle uh, quite a lot of iPhones in, in, in a short time, and you will see that already there's more than 2,200 pounds of gold in the iPhones that has been retrieved, and that's a, a very significant, valuable natural resource for many other things. And also, um, Hello Tractor. The Hello Tractor is in Nigeria. Uh, so it's not, it's not Europe or the U.S. only having these um, um, advancements, uh, which optimizes the tractor utility for the farmers, uh, optimizes the routes, and allows them to uh, make out the best out of their circle and the system that they have created. That's also helping quite a lot with fuel consumption and the way they are organizing their business. Now, this is... One example that I want you to remember out of this presentation for us is a very crucial example because this is the building of Deloitte in Amsterdam. This is called The Edge. The Edge is the most sustainable building in the world. 98% that's the rate they've got and is the best that you can get in the world. So it includes a number of innovations and one of them, for example, in the lightning system, they do not have the traditional lightning which is powered by 230 volts, is by ethernet cable, which generates a lot of information for the management of the building. They have 32,000 sensors in the building, which enables a tre tremendous amount of data to flow and a lot of information to be given. They allow them to have space optimization, but everything is optimized. For example, cleaning services. Even the cleaning ladies, they have a little, little bit of an iPad, and they can see that in that area, nobody has walked, nobody has been today, so there's no need to go there and proactively uh, clean. There's no need to do that. Um, the same with the heating and the same with the air. The air is very important because this intelligent sense tells them, or the, the, uh, or the autonomous system in the building, where the people are located, what is the intensity, and they channel air flow depending on the intensity of the building, which helps quite a lot the health, which uh, addresses the fatigue that we all have, all of us in the, in, in the, uh, in the office. But very crucial, is that the edge is producing 10% more energy that is consuming. So can you imagine that? Now we have a building that is doing that. So keep this example because here one of the questions that we have, is this technology, is this infrastructure, is it only about engineers, mechanics, what it is about? Now imagine the edge example in a bigger landscape. 
So imagine it in a big city whereby the buildings are becoming smart, where the buildings can share the energy. Because one of the pro problems that the edge has right now, they are producing this excess energy. But because this, the grid is not, um, let's say it's an old one, it cannot enable to transfer the energy to another building. Which this is the way, for example, that you can create a sustainable business model, a sustainable city, a smart city, and many other information that can be collected in this way. So some ongoing research that we're doing, and this is related to the technology, um, but before doing that, it's good that, and, and someone mentioned it before, the sustainable development. I think sometimes it's good to, to remember what it is about, okay? And uh, this, this term strikes me, and I, and I have it, and I use it many times, uh, that sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So we are working on technological advancements that would enable that. And for example, EDGE is a building of technological advancements that actually enables that. But then a little bit about our own work, okay? We are working on uh, re uh, research projects where we got funding from the European Union. One is called the CIOT framework, which is pairing the circular economy and the Internet of Things. So practically what we have been discussing so far, technological advancements and business models, this is something that we would like to, to show it to you. Uh, we created with the team a little bit of animation just to you know, uh, enable everybody to be a bit relaxed. So um, I hope everybody will like it. How can technology make an impact on circular economy? Is it possible that new disruptive business models can emerge through the synthesis of these domains, which can enable us to better serve the economy and the society? The answer is yes. Circular economy is characterized as an economy that is restorative and regenerative by design and which aims to keep products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times. It is conceived as a continuous positive development cycle, reforming the current take, make, dispose economic model by preserving and enhancing the natural capital, optimizing resource yields, and minimizing system risks by managing efficiently finite stocks and renewable flows. On the technology side, many companies have already begun to integrate Internet of Things technologies into their operations and they make projections for a vast future penetration. The interplay between circular economy and the Internet of Things provides a fertile ground for innovation and value creation, extending the useful life of finite resources and maximizing the utilization of assets, creating an emerging class of looping assets and regenerating natural capital for more effective and efficient use are key circular economy value drivers. IoT value drivers enable new window of opportunity to open on the economic cycle so that we can create a new breed of circular economics. IoT becomes a surveying enabler by collating knowledge about asset locations, conditions, quality and performance in real time and over time. The feedback rich nature of circular economy models might conversely make them particularly suitable to help extract value from a large amount of data generated by IoT. Therefore, an even more extended range of opportunities emerges when these value drivers are paired and their congruency is extensively explored. So in conclusion, by applying the circular economy and IoT framework, we get new value drivers which unleash a whole value creation for the economy and the society. Such a diverse challenge requires the right mix of skills, knowledge and capacity in order for the framework to be developed. This fusion of knowledge was achieved through the partnership of lead academic and industrial partners from all over Europe. So, um, this quick video was just to show you that one thing, that we have the circular economy that we all know, and we are all working and we're discussing these two days, but we have also the IoT, which is something that, again, we all know it's in our society. So this framework that we are working on right now is to deliver those business models and to find these common properties that will enable the new challenges to be used in, in favor of the society and the economy. And for example, uh, the edge, again, I'm coming back to that, that's why I put this as an example, so you can have something in your mind has enabled that 
actually because of this, uh, of this um, uh, concept in the model. So what we are researching under that is to make these models more visible because as my colleagues said before, there are many things that are not visible. And the other thing that I wanted to show you uh, uh, on this video is that this has been achieved because we have been together partners from uh, industry, from academia, from SMEs, and we managed to put these different things together because in isolation, you cannot achieve much. Um, very quickly, um, the same thing applies in the ideal cities project that we have, which is intelligence-driven urban internet of things ecosystems, and actually this is linked with the other project as well, and we are trying to take the value out of, oh, sorry, uh, we're taking the value out of the cities, and we are trying to take uh, bottom-up to en the enabling technologies of the city, the business imperatives, the value generation, the city services that can be enabled through the models, and, of course, the circular economy ecosystem. So it's not just about the economy. It's also the societal benefit. Um, la uh, almost last one is the um, big data uh, project that we have, industrial-driven big data. Why? Because what we're discussing so far, all these models will generate an enormous amount of data. How do we treat those data? What do we do with data? How do we take decisions? Data processing is so complex nowadays. So through, through this project, that we, all these three projects are being developed in parallel, we are trying to come up with models that will allow us to have um, swift uh, data processing at even at the lowest level, easy to use even for the non-IT user because we don't want the people to be away from the tools that take decisions. We want them to be enabled to have these tools to be able to take decisions coming out of vast data. So um, last, that's the last one. Uh, blockchain intelligent asset exchange. That's another thing that we're working on. Why? Because all these sensors, all these IOTs, they are owned by some people, but they don't have an identity. Imagine if you can start through blockchain technology, giving them some identity. Um, so the takeaways that I want to give you is that technology in all, in all its forms will be play a catalytic role in the implementation and proliferation of the circular economy. The generation of the right information and the processing, which hopefully can be unbiased, it will be key for the uh, circular economy business model. Fusion of knowledge, this is really important for us, knowledge coming from different actors, awareness and education, awareness for the professional, education yet for the youngest, and breaking the silos of the domains, because circular economy is not just about recycling. We want to have these domains being broken and be working together. And we are certainly looking at new frontiers of knowledge. Thank you very much, Bas. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Then the floor is for Carl Franken from Vito from Belgium. Ah, thanks. Okay. I realize that I'm the last speaker of this one and a half day conference before the closing ceremony, but I'm happy to have this position because I will give you a sort of a, sort of a wrap up. I will tell you again, what was the circuit economy about? Why, how does it interact with uh, technologies? And I will end with an invitation. So it's about the future of information technology for circular economy. And I want to start with, a, um, with this picture. It's a, for me, it, it triggered me. It's a painting I found in a museum two, two weeks ago, and it's a painting from uh, the year 1500, and it shows time. And next to the painting, it says, well, it's only since 1700 that we see time as linear. So we, time is also something cyclical, and I like this very much. So apparently somewhere after the 1500s, we lost this idea that we live in a cyclical system, which is time in itself. So I wanted to give this, I, I like the, the message very much that we need to get back to, the, to this idea of not only the economy as a circle, but also time as a, as a circular thing. So what is this circular economy then? Um, well, I, uh, it's good to come back to the definition because we've talked about it a lot over the past few days and very many people have talked about it as if it were the recycling society, but the circular economy goes much beyond the recycling society because in the circular economy you want to keep the value of the products at the highest level possible. And it should lead us to an imagination of a future vision, of a future type of city which looks different than the cities that we see if we are here on top of the 50th floor of the big hotel and we look around. This is not the type of city that we see. So in 2050, we want to see a different city, which is a circular city. 
And that means that we will need to focus much more on reuse, on repair, on sharing systems. And it's this type of systems which are implemented very small already at different places. You can find sharing bikes in all cities in Europe. Uh, there's repair services for, uh, in this case, for uh, small coffee machines. And there's a lot of small initiatives and, and well, smaller and bigger initiatives which trigger this reuse, repair and share systems. And the, um, the report that Nabil Nasser has presented gives a very good survey of all these systems and of their strengths. So it's not enough anymore in the circular economy that we take our waste. This is a, a picture taken in London and it's, it's a very nice one because the boat is called resource. But what the boat does is it pulls away the waste of the city to process it somewhere else. We don't really know where it is going to, this linear boat, and we let's call it a resource, then it's easier for us, and then we don't remember that it's just taking the waste away from the society. This is not how we see it. So this is sort of, it's, it tries to be the picture of, of the future, but it's the picture of the past. Yeah, let's take the resources away from the city. So, the circular economy, now that I've pictured it, it doesn't only bring governance challenges or challenges about what we do with the material, there is technology into that as well. There are technological challenges that we face in order to realize this circular economy. And, well, I sort of like to divide them in those four categories. We need advanced collection, sorting and recycling technologies. We need to be able to identify the materials, the resources, the secondary materials, to know where to bring them to, to know how to reuse them, to know how to recycle them. And for that we need apps, we need sensors, we need robots to automate those processes. Then we need efficient material processing technologies. If we have the materials, we need processes that are automated, we need machine learning, we need artificial intelligence to be able to reprocess these materials in a very efficient way. Next step is that we need production technologies that can be automated very easily and that work in a very resource efficient way. That can be, for instance, 3D printing, but also disassembly technologies, design for repairability. And then at the consumer level, on the next level, we need interactive platforms to enhance the content connectivity between the materials, like the Internet of Things, but also apps and platforms to enhance the connectivity between the consumers. Yeah? Think about the example of this morning, where the consumers sell second-hand goods to each other. This is a platform. So all these needs are digital technologies. Yeah? It goes from sensors over learning, machine learning, internet, connectivity, platforms. It's all digital technologies what we need. And if you look around to these sort of conferences, like the one we're having here, the number of digital technologists and IT people is relatively limited, typically. Who is an IT person in this room? Who would consider himself an ITer? Yeah? Okay, there's almost three people, four. Four ITers in the room in this World Circular Economy session where we're looking at the technologies. Yeah? So, it is a separate world. The world of the manufacturing people and the IT people is still very much separate from the world of the circular economy people, and we need to break the barrier. And um, we're also organizing a conference, the GSTIC conference, which is a conference which discusses technologies for the SDGs, and it was uh, organized last year in Brussels, and it will happen again next November in Brussels. And there we had a, a circular economy session, and these were two of the conclusions. It says that the necessary digital technologies, they exist, but the challenge is to make them available and to integrate them into a systemic approach that leads to sustainability. There's very many, very important words in that sentence. So the digital technologies, we don't need to invent them anymore. They are there, but we are not using them. We don't invite the ITers into this room. That's what we should do. And if we do that, together we can De develop digital twinning as a key concept. We need to think about how can we make a digital replica of the material that we have so we can study and optimize the digital replica before we start making the material. That will help us to make materials and products first time right, so we don't have to throw away all the test pieces. We optimize it in a digital form and then we can make a product first time right by digital twinning. That concept is already applied in product uh, design. 
and you see here an, an example of a windmill, but we need to apply it to the full value chain. What if we can predict the value chain, the chain that a product will go through, and if we have this um, virtual value chain, we might even be able to change the route that a certain product is following once it has a tendency to go in the wrong direction. So, if we translate all this, and we, we were sitting at this GC conference in a, in a similar room like this, and we asked the people to think and to discuss, we came to this very important conclusion. We can't have a circular economy without the fourth industrial revolution and the digital uh, technologies, that's what I've explained. But there's a very important second line here. If we let the digital technology do, if we would be in a room full of ITers, they probably would not ask questions about sustainability like the lady did here in the front. So it's up to us, the circular economy world, to depict a picture, a vision of where we want to be in 2050 and to guide the digital people to reach that vision. So the digital uh, transformation will only be sustainable if it includes the circular economy. So that's a call indeed to sit together and to bring our message to the people in the digital world. So there are some examples then of technologies that you can develop, and uh, this is an example, so I will give two veto examples because we're developing those technologies. One is this one, where we uh, set up uh, a sensor, um, a sensor device, a machine which uses different types of sensors and integrates all these data into an, uh, an application which is triggered by machine learning and helps to or learns to identify a complex material flow. So if on the belt, it's a moving belt, if you pass a complex mix of materials, the machine can identify the different types of materials. It can say this is cork, this is wood, this is metal, this is plastic, but it also weighs the material. It can also determine the mass of the material. So once you've put the material through the machine, you have a perfect mass balance and a composition analysis of your flow which is very powerful in order to automate sorting processes, for instance. A second example of platform technologies that you need is that in this circular economy, we'll also need new players, people, new, uh, people that have an, uh, a role in between the consumer and the producer. The circular economy will develop new services, and the services need people that bring that services to the consumer. And this is an example of a project that will be presented tomorrow in one of the side events, the Circusol project, where we are developing a new business concept for the leasing, the refurbishment, and the recycling of solar panels. And we present this as a service model to the, con to the consumer. So the consumer is not, um, doesn't get a very complex thing. He gets a single service. So there is a new intermediate that we need to define, the product service provider, who will be some sort of a platform uh, generator. And this product service provider is in contact with a whole network of manufacturing, remanufacturing, refurbishing, and, um, and dealers of solar panels. And we will set up this whole innovation chain within this project. So if you want to learn more, tomorrow you can learn more about it. Um, that's one thing. So we need to develop these technologies, but as I told before, we also need to sit together and share the knowledge. Uh, with that aim, we have uh, set up a new research alliance in Europe where we are sitting together with the 10 RTOs, the 10 research institutes that know much about circular economy, and we've brought them together in what we call the European Circular Economy Research Alliance. You can see the name of the organizations here. And we're bringing those or organizations together to share knowledge, and in order to to not compete with each other, but to complement each other, we exchange our knowledge on circular economy. One more slide before the conclusions, and that's this one. So we need to sit together, we need to exchange information, and that's what we want to do also with this GST conference, where we want to bring people together and, and exchange lessons learned between what we learn here today, between what is learned by, at the regional TRIAR forum, the ISWA, which is having their conference also today and, and the days before, the World Resources Forum that will have their conference in uh, February, and also the European Circuit Economy Stakeholder Platform. It's very important that we exchange our knowledge with all these different partners, and that's the role that GSTIC wants to play. So my conclusions are, there's technology in innovation needs, which are dig digital, and there's a need for worldwide interaction and to exchange the lessons learned. And with that, 
I'd like to invite you, as I said, now that this con conference has come to a conclusion, to meet us at GSTIC in 2018 in Brussels at the end of November. I thank you very much. Well, thank you, Carl, for this uh, closing speech for the whole conference. Uh, but we have a plenary to go huh, after, the, after the coffee break. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually an, a very nice wrap up. Uh, you know, um, the science exists, apparently. It just has to be used. Look at that edge building that you showed, I think, from Amsterdam. Uh, suppose all office buildings were like that edge building. All is smart, smart, smart. So that's the, that's the thing that we all have to do. We are all stupid, but we have to become smart, right? Um, I think two questions would be okay, right? And then we go for coffee. Who would have a question for uh, one of the two gentlemen? Or you want to have coffee? No questions? Everything was clear? Yes. Yeah, my name is Alex Pen from Taiwan. I quite like both of your talk, how to integrate or how to fusion the modern technology or emerging technology with domain. Have you actually working with industry to make the real implementation of these technology with a certain industry. Can you give us an example? How, how can you overcome this barrier? I think everybody have their own languages or value. How do you overcome? Um, very good question. Actually, um, in the example that you remember, uh, uh, the edge building, one of the innovations that was there is uh, um, um, in the construction of the building, they work with Philips, and in the lightning of the building, they didn't put bulbs that they are powered by 230 volt. They put panels that they are lightened by ethernet cable, which is very low in consumption, and at the same time, gathering data from the room on the occupancy and so on and so forth. So the point here, what happened is that it's not that the technology experts went to the building, but it was, in that case, it was the engineers, the architects that they were thinking, how can we do that in a different way? And then they, what Carl was saying, they addressed their questions to the right people, to the IT people, and they talked to many companies, and Philips came up with this proposal. So your message actually is the more crucial of this, and, and I'm happy that we didn't coordinate with Carl on the presentation, so we delivered the same messages, because the problem is exactly that, is that this, and this proves it here. We have four ITs in the room. How can we can break this silo that we have some needs for business needs when we are not talking to the right people or the right people are not here to listen to our needs? So that is exactly that. So that's, that's one of the examples. There are many other examples like industries being, um, sensors being implemented in trash bins. So the, the, so the, the, the cars, they know which trash bins are empty or not, so they optimize the routes and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, applications and examples that are out there. Thank you. Well, then uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the two gentlemen, of course, for uh, these insights uh, on the potential of the ICT uh, for circular economy. Please give them a, a big hand. <laughs> And this, uh, this sums up our, uh, our session. Uh, don't forget, of course, this thing. It's an electronic device. It's here it is really very functional. It doesn't work outside. Last night I walked in the streets of Tokyo Center. There was a lady coming to me. She spoke something in Japanese to me. I did this, but the, nothing came out. So you can really, you can give it back. Thank you to the translators.